squat scorn this video is sponsored by squarespace the antoine dupont of website builders it's always amazing what you can accomplish in 20 minutes when you're really in the mood. But where for most of us that means cleaning a corner of the house you've been putting off for months, actually going for a run, finally ringing the gas company, getting to World 8 and Super Mario Bros, making a decision on Jumbo Jet Sex Games Future, resetting a scrum, learning what Macazole Mapipi looks like, or covering two thirds of what Uruguay have been up to for the last four years, the All Blacks this Saturday took 20 minutes to post us all a pretty handy reminder that reports of their demise have been greatly exaggerated, as they delivered possibly the best 20 minutes of rugby we'll see this summer, unless the Pro Day Dut allows forward to start the season on several tabs of speed. In an up and down few years, the Kiwis this weekend delivered a definitive up as they tore apart the Springboks in the opening stanza before spending 60 just keeping the pieces far enough apart before a final blow at the final whistle. Rugby's great test rivalry good as decided before half time. So how did the All Blacks get off to that incredible start? What inspired the South African comeback and with just a few games remaining before France, how does this bolster New Zealand's chances and do the Springboks have any serious worries to be digging into from this game? That start on Saturday was ferocious and fast without ever being frantic. Tactical control underpinning the dynamism and relentless power, every part of the game feeding into those two opening tries. And in order to dig into how, I'm sorry everybody, but I'm going to need to talk once again about tactical kicking at some length. Four years ago, the Springboks won the Rugby World Cup thanks in no small part to some ingenious kicking tactics knitted with their incredible defence, meaning the box were always in control of the game. That's what they were seeking with those kicking tactics, regardless of who had the ball. Instead of box kicking for the winger to regather the norm at the time, they looked to set the defence in advance and smoke the opposition, bullying them backwards applying the squeeze until they reluctantly kicked it back having lost another 10 metres. Around halfway, Andre Pollard popularised the cross-field bomb, just hanging it here towards the far wing. Ireland and Wales' defence coaches Andy Farrell and Sean Edwards at the time had popularised a 14-man defensive line with just the fullback in behind, so this bomb became a nightmare to deal with as it sailed over the winger's head, but the fullback was usually really far away. South Africa only punted long, properly putting their foot through it when they were inside their own 22 and were looking for touch, as it allowed them to reset the defence through the line-out and just keep their pressure up. They were very very happy to hang the ball so they could chase otherwise. In the three years since, near enough every team in Test Rugby has adopted elements of these strategies and they've become International Rugby's bread and butter, a delicious snack that we all love. The All Blacks on Saturday inverted all of this in a manner that good as nullified the box strategy from the off. Where the Springboks only clear long from the 22, almost every time New Zealand found themselves near their own goal line, they exited like this. They play a face here to create a better angle, but instead of either the scrum off send a box kick it to the South Island or Barrett blasting it down the sideline as far as a human can, the phase has moved the All Blacks more central rather than into one close to the touchline and Barrett sets in right behind the ruck and he sends it right up in the air. It's the crossfield bomb the box popularised around halfway and it's one of the best ones you'll ever see. The height is enormous but the placement is perfect. When defending exits, the Springboks like to keep the open side winger, in this case Mapimpi, in the main line with the fly half, if you're Grant Nisbet, also Mapimpi, and the number eight dropping back to give LaRue a hand in the backfield. As such, Mapimpi is coming, real Mapimpi, is coming onto the ball backwards and as any coach will tell you, you always want the player that's coming forwards onto the ball heading towards the opposition try line to be the guy claiming it, so Willemser here calls it as his. Except, because Bodie's placement is so good, he's herring some 40 metres to meet the exact midpoint between where him and Mapimpi start. Each would have the furthest to travel, and it creates maximum confusion. Will Jordan is basically chasing on his own, but he doesn't need to do anything. Mapimpi gets himself in Willemser's eye line because of this confusion, and it causes him to knock it on. Willemser has ran 40 plus metres in order to do nothing. Here, but Pimpy drops a bit further back in order to cover the ground they're aiming the kick for, but Mawanga has hung it further in field, meaning with both LaRue and Mapimpi watching the touch line, expecting a clearance to touch, it allows Jordan, heading in a straight line, to just beat the turning of the clerk to the ball and take it on the full. Where the box use their kicking to control the game when the opposition had the ball, the All Blacks use it just maintain that the Springboks never had it at all. This is slightly further at field, but the idea is exactly the same. They're looking to advance down the field and control possession. Colby has started narrow to defend his blind side, but the moment the ball comes out, he sprints backwards to cover because he senses Mawanga is about to kick. And he's right. Sure enough, it goes in the air, and whilst this head start has meant Colby gets there first, he's had to run 30 metres backwards, then 20 metres to the side in about four seconds, where the Kiwi centres have just gone forwards a bit in a straight line. And he's left fumbling it. In the end, the only way for the box to stop the rock was to do the unthinkable in an average coach's mind and let the turning player heading back towards their own try line take the ball, such as Mapimpi here, who takes it in a really tricky circumstances, having to call the thing to avoid putting Willemser in the same situation as earlier. It's really rare to see a team make as much yardage on the spring box as New Zealand were able to in this game. This allowed the All Blacks a near imperial march downfield, and when they reached halfway, they were able to invert their tactics further and look to play territorial long kicks, because in a tactic just borrowed from World Cup 
opponent France, they know if they kick smartly, the box are just going to kick it back to them, which breaks the field open and allows them chances to counter-attack. Here, they regather the only traditional up and under box kick Smith has hung all day, and Mawunga charges upfield from the backfield to activate stage two, now the ground has been made, stabbing a beautiful territorial kick downfield. Very close to being a 50-22, very unlucky is passed back in. They've pulled the box backfield, which they'd like to leave light to maximise the defensive pressure, from left to right, and once it crosses touch, it then allows them to pressurise the box with a preset defence from the set piece, and eventually, the clearance barely crossed the 22, granting New Zealand a 30 metre net gain, which leads to this break by Will Jordan, which if finished could have been curtains for the box. But indeed, just as most of us in jolly old Europe were opening our curtains, the blackness were already deploying these tactics to create the opening try for everyone's favourite Seinfeld superfan, Aaron Snecky Smith. And yet, it so almost didn't happen. For right before the game, Aaron Smith was trying to rebuild his Seinfeld fan site. Struggling with HTML and all the fiddly old hat, old web nonsense, Smith only made the kickoff because he went to Squarespace. Suddenly able to construct a site with ease, Aaron Smith could add snacky clips of Jerry's finest stand-up routines, add blog posts in character as Elaine, even integrate to social media easily so the world can know just what the deal is with airline food. Squarespace made the whole process so easy, Smith was able to whiz through it, add everything so simply, make it look tidy and beautiful, and indeed arrive in time and be on hand to score his try after just three minutes. And if you're a world-class scrum half desperately in need of showing your love of 90 sitcom as well, then please head to the link in the description and use the offer code SQUIDRUGBY to save yourself some money! By the time we get to the Will Jordan take from earlier, ball has already been in play for a few seconds shy of two minutes, and possession has changed hands repeatedly. Off this scrum from a bomb out of the 22, Jordy Barrett begins things with a territorial thump. Goal being, LaRue kicks it back, and what he does, Vili gets a really great nudge, but the All Blacks play quickly. They're just trying to keep so much pace in their game on top of that kicking. De Klerk has smartly spotted that the ball leaving play means he's no longer offside, it's no longer relevant, so he hunts up to snipe Jordan, but the winger beats him easily, and it gets the All Blacks on the attack. The kick game is complemented by this insane speed of play, which we see right here. Four players enter to clear out Vitalik, more interested in generating fast ball and holding shape. This gives the Bokti insufficient time to set, so they're flying up more as three individuals than as a group. They haven't really had time to set their timing. Elizabeth and Visa are looking for huge solo shots, while Diego has attempted to slow down and remain connected as a three-man line, and in the process, disconnects, allowing Frizzell to bust the line like it's a woman's lip. 30 seconds ago, the Bok front row were in a scrum. In the time since, they've had to jog back and forth from halfway, and now Am forced to fill in around the ruck. Umbanambi has found himself inside centre. Diolande shoots up to apply Am's usual defensive role, but Umbanambi understands the system, he's a split second too slow, and it means Ioani can get on his outside, but the hooker does brilliantly to deliver him to ground. However, from this half break onwards, we see just how good the Bok defence is. It gets back into shape after all that pressure, after being split open and then taken for two game line carries, and it starts to repel the All Blacks, push giving way to pull until Quagga Smith eventually comes up with the intercept that allows a few moments later good old Faf to punish them and split the two retreating players with a superb clearance. Yet, this just means possessions change hands once again, with those front rowers now being forced to work even harder. New Zealand end up with the ball, there's a few phases of pissing about to find shape before Mawanga steps in to run the show. Jordan regathers and the All Blacks keep the ball fast, their goal is to just shift the Bok defence around, because the South African defence is largely standing firm, yet its organisation is slowly falling into tatters the longer this play goes on. Without Pollard to aid them, defensive organisation is entirely down in this game to Dialande and Am, yet thanks to Dialande chasing the offload from the kick and Am dropping back to cover Colby's position out wide while he's out position, the Springboks find themselves in a situation where their two widest out players for a moment are the two players tasked with organising their midfield defence and line speed. Colby gets back but it's still easy for them to get outside the box without them being organised at all. The wider two pod from the 1-3-2-2 formation the All Blacks have now adopted, allowing Kane to bring Talea into the game. He pops it off the ground and New Zealand keep that pace up, working a few phases back and forth just to get Springboks on the floor, keeping their line disorganised. Am is soon called to make another tackle and whilst failsafe after Clerk is stuck on the wing because they're short and numbers, Scott Barrett carries, and in the background, Brother Bowden slips a call to Richie Mwanga, who thoughtlessly executes a phase later. Two forward groups are effective decoys, buying Bowden so much time to aim, but also to pull the spring box up. The Bok wingers defend so aggressively, shooting up and in, whilst the centres then drift hard across, the free working as a complete unit, and this is exactly what Bowden wants to happen. The Pimpy fires up, DDA follows, but he's not got anyone else on his inside, and it allows the space for him to ping it over the top to give Will Jordan, maybe the most dangerous player on the planet who only speaks English, a one-on-one -on -one against Vili LaRue, a player I both adore, but also recognise in these situations sometimes has a habit of just handing his broken ankles to the ball carrier in a corner shot carrier bag instead of making a tackle. This time, however, he nails it. Except if we rewind a moment... 
point. The splitting of DDA and Am has had knock-on consequences. The ideal block line would look like this. Am, Dialande, and then one of the flankers, in this case Mostert, with then the less athletic units inside, all remaining connected as they shoot up and then press out. However, one man down, Dialande has had to start narrower than usual as he needs to remain connected with Mostert. Retallic, really sneakily, just gets in Mostert's way like a concrete pillar when you go to watch Villa, and it means the pair disconnect for just a moment. The two harry so hard that they end up overworking and forget the other factor. In the role, usually played by the flanker, is Stephen Kitchoff, who doesn't have the pace to fill the gap. And so, in Dialande and Mostert's haste, players outside them have disconnected, opening a huge gap for Jordan to dart through, allowing him to then draw the man and put Smith away for the score. It's extremely reminiscent of this try Jordan himself finished a few years ago. The Bok defence is so set in the way it presses up then works out, if you can keep the ball alive for long enough, you get them disorganised and a quick enough cut back in is starting to look like a legitimate strategy to open them up. Not all of the work the All Blacks do over that three and a half minute passage is deliberate, but every single piece of it has a knock on effect towards them having a prop defending in midfield and no Lacanio Am to fill in. The All Blacks went about their work as fast as they did because they knew it would create a disconnect of some sort at some point, largely thanks to the combination of that kicking game and their phases of working it left to right, left to right, going wide to wide, knowing it was on Barrett and Mawanga to stay alert to opportunities. Because after four years of just getting your best players on the park reasoning, I think this Saturday was the moment the Mawanga Barrett axis properly, really, really clicked and looked properly world class. Mawanga's greatest attribute has always been his ability to add value to any attack where he gets his hands on the ball. Even the most basic drop off pass becomes so much more deadly, gains so much more meterage when Mawanga is on form because he's so good at just drawing an eye line. And Barrett is his unreal vision, his ability to spot space anywhere on the field and work out how to get the ball there. And the two work so beautifully in tandem. The pair appeared perfectly on the same page every minute of the game, and able to gift the other time to do what they do best. Another example of which led to the second try of the opening 20 scored by the bulldozing Shannon Frizzell. Frizzell had probably the best game of his career on Saturday, playing for physicality and aggression he normally reserves for women he just met in a nightclub, smashing, throwing off and battering through countless springboks like they were women he just met in a nightclub. And there's no better demonstration of that than this try, leaving Billy the Russo bloodied and bruised you'd think he was a woman he just met in a nightclub. It begins, once again, with a kick. Talea's chase is great, but the other All Blacks are the point of interest, just hovering, expecting a tap back, rather than Talea to take on the fold, or make a tackle and follow up with the defensive line. The ball bobbles right in the hands of Bowden Barrett, who, once more, waits for the Springbok defence to come up a bit in his teammates' faces, before delivering a trademark Bodhi beauty. Honestly, like, butterflies watching this. With LaRue pulled in to contest the kick, Mpimpi has filled his position at fullback, and it leaves Jordan unmarked out wide. Makazoli recovers, but Jordan and Jordan keep the ball alive, and then Bodhi goes wide the other way. The All Blacks have recently shifted to that 1 3 2 2 formation, and the shape's simplicity means they're perfectly in pattern without ever having to set a phase. Taylor steams onto the ball, timing his pass perfectly, and the players out wide keep it moving. Retallic eventually taking it in, but the All Blacks have now gone from one touchline to the other to the other, back and forth three times in the space of 22 seconds. Now, the previous try gives us a perfect example of Franz Malherber's role in the Springbok defensive setup. Without doing for on the pitch, his job is to organise around the ruck, and as such he's expected to get within a metre or so of every single breakdown, whilst the rest of the defence sets around him, he's the kind of focal point they all set off. As you can see here, over every All Black phase, Malherba is setting on the side, then hustling hard to get to the next ruck once the ball comes out. Not to have a real impact, but to allow everyone else to do so, while he does the necessary generic dude on the side kind of thing. Indeed, the only phase where he isn't there is this one, where Talea makes huge yardage around the breakdown. As such, when Mwanga hangs this high ball, he's waiting at the ruck. Malherba then begins to track inwards towards Talea layer before the ball bounces and he works out the Barrett who kicks it so he works out towards the other touchline in order to set around that road. Yeah. Now Herbert trundles towards the other touchline again, back towards theirs, but the phrase, the ball this fast and the man, somehow surprisingly even applies to Franz Malherber, so he's only managed to get into midfield by the time Smith gets the ball out. Something Bowden Barrett is very aware of. Most defences nowadays, since the aforementioned Edwards Farrell revolution, rely on their 12 in this kind of situation to turn and recover chips. But that's exactly the position Franz Malherber has now found himself in through just trying to get to ruck to ruck. Barrett dinks it over, knowing there's no way a knackered tight head can get there in time, and then eventually recovers covers the bounce himself. NZ keep the ball alive as Jordan, set in the boot way over here, spies an opportunity. Malherber rushes back to his spot, but he only arrives as Smith is getting the ball out to Jordan. He's harried and not focused, allowing the winger to hair in on the angle. Malherber's sheer desperation means he does brilliantly and manages to slow him down, but the aforementioned 1-3-2-2 formation means the All Blacks are in position with the two on the touchline so quickly without even needing a phase. Jordan flows it over the top to Taylor, who delivers another gorgeous pass to Frizzell, who bumps the defence aside like it was nothing. Not even worth 
noticing. Funnily enough, exactly what the NZIU did with his conviction last year. It was a stunning start to the game, but weirdly, I think a few of the smaller game management moments from later on once the Springboks have got back into it may be more telling in whether the All Blacks can go on to win that fourth World Cup this year. This phenomenal ball presentation by Scott Barrett allows Smith to buy a penalty right after the Boxer got themselves back in the game. Is the kind of moment of now to cancel out an immense effort moments early by the Box to get their prior penalty that wins you World Cups? It's both worth points and emotionally devastating for the Springboks. And the second half was just full of these moments, continued with a more controlled approach to the kicking game. However, there is still a concern in the fact that they did let the box back into the game. The mall try, scored by Malcolm Marks, follows this final effort by Augustin Creevy last week. Forward coach Jason Ryan prides himself on his mall defence, having infamously only conceded one mall try over three years with Crusaders, and they went his entire first year of the All Blacks without letting anyone smash over. So, to see it happen in consecutive weeks might be a tiny bit of a concern. However, the defence otherwise did remain immensely solid, especially since we had the Springboks throwing some completely new ideas at the table. I discussed in my video last month how the Springboks have been evolving their attack, but we saw them take it to another gear this Saturday. Here, the box hit Colby on the short side so they can set shape from an edge, just so they're in the widest possible position so everyone else can set from a sideline, because it allows their forwards to fold into a 2-4-2 formation. This is a shape pioneered by the Crusaders in order to make the most of a pack that can handle the ball, and I've never seen a team whose forwards are so power-focused like South Africa attempt it, but it goes brilliantly. The four-man group sets in line with the scrum, minimising their effort but also tying the the entire All Blacks pack in. Marks and Smith, the second two-man group, storm in and take out the furthest forwards and first back, meaning the box backs can then adopt a France-style stretch formation, expanding their width. And whilst the forwards flood onto the clerk's shoulder, Jordan is forced up to shut down the Rue, who spots this and puts in the kick. It's brilliantly weighted and an amazing option, it just drifts out of play, because if this lands in field, Mpimpi is regathering with Am and his support to return the favour paid in the World Cup final, and probably still air him on the celebration. That attack was a one-off, an experiment, it was the only time the box ran that pattern in the game, but I'd wager we'll be seeing more of this at the World Cup as they continue evolving their wider game into something properly exciting, because it did such a good job of sucking in the All Blacks and limiting the impact they can have on defence, even if they weren't making enormous meterage off it. However, they will need to fix one other teeny tiny problem. They want to kick on at the World Cup. Just one tiny, little, small, minor, very, 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 very tiny, minor issue, barely an issue at all, really. It's just, it's a very, very small problem that I like to call not having a fly half. Damien Willemser is a hell of a treat to watch. He's, I, I love watching him. He's the kind of player who can do anything, but he's also the rare sort of back who is more talented than he is good. At points on Saturday, instead of running the attack in the way Pollard or even the Bock would, we saw him linger on the wing, just sit away, not even floating in the boot as a distributor. Over South Africa's first two significant attacks, their two most threatening passages of the half, Willemser's every touch he carried himself. Now that, in each individual example, was a good decision, but Willemser's lack of willing to get involved and just give the boring passes or organise the shape or do any of the unsexy things left Billy LaRue kind of overworked. Whether the All Black 10-15 was working perfect tandem to get the best out of each other, the Rue on Saturday were stuck doing the job for both of them, and it only makes the eventual highlight of the attack, the try for Cheslin Colby, more telling, because this is the one time they do really click together. The Rue is best deployed as a distributor with width, able to call the shape when he can see the full width of the pitch to assess and deliver passes, and call what's required. And we see what can be accomplished when Willems are here slots into play 10, decision making but letting the Rue do his thing. Willems are organised the shape himself, these three forwards acting as a superb screen for the Rue to unlock the other backs, Am eventually carrying into a weak seam in the defence for a lovely bit of yardage. And from there, LaRue sees what's on and does exactly what you want from him. He's so flat that the All Blacks have no choice but to mark him, even though all he's doing is delivering a pass with one step forward maybe. It adds so much dynamism to the attack, and the second phase, when films are back in the picture, the pair set beautifully. He gives Philly five and a half realistic options to hit, meaning these two defenders have six men to mark, so LaRue hits the widest possible carrier to force them to floor, meaning the other All Blacks have to work as hard as possible in order to get outside where the box are now folding onto the short side. The Mulin is a threat worth watching, but it's the presence of Willemser that really does it here. A realistic distribution threat means Talea shoots up, he has to watch it, and as he comes to cut off Willemser's time, it allows LaRue to throw an unbelievable beauty of a pass, a glorious ball over the top to Colby, who can launch up and finish it absolutely sub 
sublimely. This is what the Bok attack can be when it's firing on all cylinders. The problem isn't anything Willemser is doing, it's the stuff he isn't doing, namely operating as a fly-off for more than one or two passages a game. Andre Pollard is expected to be fit again before the World Cup, and you'd better hope he is if you're a Bok fan, because I'm starting to think South Africa's title hopes may just rest more on their first choice of 10 being fit than Ireland's do on Jigglypug sex facts. Because ultimately, the Bok on Saturday found themselves taken apart as comprehensively as anyone's managed in the Razi Rasmus era. This wasn't an embarrassment by any means, but it was a message sent, received, and retransmitted loud and clear. The All Blacks are not heading to France for nothing. They're coming for that trophy. Winning a World Cup will require a little more than 20 minutes of unbelievable concentration from either team, but Saturday night might have shown us the roadmap, the blueprint, the ideas that we could be looking back in a few months' time and going, oh. If Ian Foster's New Zealand are indeed going to take it home on October 28th. Thank you for watching that. I really hope you enjoyed it. I hope you had a lovely time. Um, I Sorry I talked very quickly in that one. I think particularly so. And all the other videos. That and I've some done. of the others. I think there's a few where I've spoken... Um, Slowly. Uh, the doing a video on every team at the World Cup. There's one on South Africa already. If you want to go look at that, I mentioned it. We should look at how the Bok attack is evolving and changing. Uh, there is one coming up on... Portugal! My favourite team, your favourite team, team. your favourite team. Best team that is going to be in the Rugby World Cup coming up. Uh, we'll also look at the All Blacks after that. I'm going to look at them after the Rugby Championship and kind of go over all the games in full and kind of, you know, like dig into all of them, including the World Jordan Trial we didn't mention in this one in order to save something back for that because there's a lot going on. Uh, there's plenty of more rugby happening. So there's Portugal coming up, Scotland, Samoa, other nations that are in the World Cup. And we'll see you very soon for more rugby. Nice. What's the deal with Eddie Stavia? Could he go on the land or was he just restricted to water? <laughs> well, I think I saw him on land a couple of times.